Hello, uh, my name is Heather Chang. I'm uh, the director of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance Prostate Cancer Genetics Clinic and an associate professor at the University of Washington and Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Today, I'm really excited to tell you about what's new in prostate cancer treatment. All right, so here are my disclosures. And let's see, all right, so here's the outline of uh, what I'll cover in the next 30 or so minutes. I'm first gonna talk um, briefly about an overview of prostate cancer disease states for those of you who don't think about prostate cancer all the time. And then I'm gonna talk about the treatment toolbox, which um, is getting larger and we've got some new exciting agents in this toolbox that might be of particular interest to patients uh, or people in the, in the horse community. Um, many of you may be familiar with PARP inhibitors. I'm gonna talk about those in, uh, specifically with respect to prostate cancer, um, uh, pembrolizumab, which is an immune checkpoint inhibitor, and a new agent in prostate cancer that we anticipate to be available soon called um, lutetium or LU177 PSMA 617, which is kind of a mouthful, but it's really exciting and I wanna share with you some of the early um, excitement about it. And then I'm gonna talk briefly about the PROMISE registry, which may also be of interest and then uh, summary and take home points. All right, so let's get started. Um, so here is a map and I'm gonna come back to this framework of prostate cancer disease states. Um, so on the left is people who may have inherited cancer risk mutations, such as BRCA1, BRCA2, Lynch syndrome um, genes, and these, patients may be at increased risk for prostate cancer. And so there are opportunities for early detection, cancer screening. I talked about this in the past, um, I think last year at this meeting, so you can check out that, um, that information. It's also on the FORCE website. Um, when people are diagnosed, um, there are occasions when if it is a low risk or low um, kind of what we would call kind of a wimpy prostate cancer, a low Gleason score, doesn't have... Um, it isn't thought to have high aggressive potential. We might consider active surveillance. Some patients are appropriate for curative intent treatment. So these are sort of the localized cured, curable cancers. We have uh, surgery as an option, as well as radiation plus ADT. And when I say ADT, I mean androgen deprivation therapy. And um, many of you may be able to sort of think about the analogy in other cancers, breast cancer and ovarian cancer. This is kind of hormone therapy. It's what we call kind of hormone therapy in the prostate cancer setting. So ADT, uh, androgen being another word for testosterone. So um, radiation plus hormone therapy. And then um, as a medical oncologist, I'm often at the, um, the far end of the disease spectrum, which is advanced, very treatable. I'm gonna tell you about our treatment options in this setting. There's sort of some additional sort of um, smaller, I won't go through all the details. There's different sub subcategories of advanced disease. Really it boils down to, is it sensitive to hormone therapy? or do we need to add on more than just hormone therapy? And can we see it on scans or not see it on scans? And so um, the, the important point is this is a treatable um, population. We have a lot of really exciting treatments. Oftentimes new agents get introduced in this most um, advanced setting and then they get moved earlier into, for example, localized disease uh, once we know they're effective in the, the latest stages. So that's kind of an overview. I'm gonna come back to this framework I also wanted to mention um, the different kinds of medical um, team members that might be involved at different stages. So in this early detection um, screening stage, it's often urologists or primary care providers. Um, some patients um, in the force community who have cancer risk mutations may want to seek care at a dedicated cancer risk um, clinic um, to sort of have access to some of the most up-to-date opportunities. And then once patients are diagnosed or you know, they often are diagnosed with a urologist, um, and then in the treatment phase, oftentimes there's a medical oncologist involved um, administering the hormone therapy or, and or radiation oncologist. And then in the advanced disease setting, usually the medical oncologist is kind of the key driver. And then we often will partner with uh, radiation oncology as urology as well. But the role for urology may be a little less in this setting than it is in the localized disease setting. Um, okay, so... Um, I wanted to point out uh, something that kind of launched a new awareness of the importance of cancer risk mutations in prostate cancer. This audience and the force audience doesn't really need too much a reminder of why this is important, but in prostate cancer, uh, the prostate cancer community, we learned 
uh, in 2016 or so from this um, important paper in New England Journal of Medicine that one in 10 men with metastatic prostate cancer, so that's this, this stage where we can see that the cancer has spread outside of the prostate. This is kind of the most advanced disease setting that one in 10, actually over one in 10 men um, had inherited mutations in DNA repair genes such as BRCA2, ATM, CHECK2, BRCA1. Many in, the, in you in the audience may um, be familiar with these genes, may potentially even carry one of these genes. So this is really important, and I'll talk a little bit more why, but at the time, this was a much higher number or proportion than we previously recognized. Um, and now we have more data suggesting that in these earlier disease states, it's also um, more prevalent than we thought. So depending on whether it's sort of the most high risk um, localized, still curable um, prostate cancer, the, the percentage is about five to 10. So this is, and this is irrespective of family history. When you add family history in, those proportions go up much further. So um, these are all things that are important to think about. If you already are aware of an um, inherited cancer risk mutation, then I'm hoping that we will begin to leverage that information at all disease, all, air, all sort of points at the disease spectrum. Um, so I'm going to begin talking or move into talking about advanced disease. So again, this is not people who are at risk or not people who are um, thinking about surgery or radiation. This is people who may, may need further treatment um, in this advanced disease setting. And this, I'm not gonna go through all these lines. This is just to give you a flavor of what's available in the treatment toolbox. So when I um, talk to my patients as a medical oncologist, I'm also often saying, well, you know, we're gonna be looking at the toolbox. We're gonna try to pick our best agent. And, you know, there's a lot of things in there. Hopefully you won't need them really soon. And we'll go through them one by one. And as we're getting treatment, there may be new things being added to the toolbox. So the toolbox that is on the left here in, um, listed is some of the exciting new available agents, starting with, um, well, the first one is sort of the oldest one that we have the most data for, which is hormone therapy, really, um, suppression of testosterone. But these other ones are all relatively new and have different mechanisms of action. For example, there are um, more, more, more effective hormone therapies, or there's an immunotherapy here, there's chemotherapy, there's a radio, um, two new radio kind of radiation therapy, um, we call them radiation-based therapies. One that's currently FDA approved called radium-223 or Zofigo. And then another one, which I'm gonna come back to called lutetium or also known as LU-177 PSMA-617, which uh, is anticipated because we did have phase three positive results reported in June of this year, 2021. And then over here on the right, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these agents too, are the, what I would consider the sort of specialized treatment toolbox that might be great options for people who have underlying cancer risk mutations in certain genes, such as Lynch syndrome genes might be um, served by pembrolizumab and um, patients who may have BRCA1, BRCA2, and other gene mutations that I'm going to talk about further may be eligible for PARP inhibitors. And we have two that are approved through Caprib and Olaparib, um, as well as carboplatin chemotherapy. Um, many of these may not be completely new to this audience because you may have heard about these drugs being used for ovarian cancer and breast cancer and maybe pancreatic cancer too. Um, but for prostate cancer, these are new agents. And so we're pretty excited to have this as an option uh, specifically approved for prostate cancer. So they're not off-label treatments, but um, they're things that we can get for patients. But again, at this point, it's mostly in the most advanced disease setting. So it is in the toolbox, but it may be a matter of timing too. So sometimes people will wonder, well, can I get it at the very first, you know, when we have a diagnosis? And it may be that at this point, the data is more robust for surgery and or radiation with hormone therapy. And we're not employing those new agents yet, although there are trials investigating whether or not they're better to be used earlier. Um, so right now they're standard at this later stage. Okay, so this is um, 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 sort of a schematic of DNA repair uh, defects and cancer. Um, so BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, ATM, 
check one, check two, rad 51. They're part of this um, team of genes that are important for homologous recombination. Um, and so, and then um, for Lynch syndrome, MSH2, MSH6, and the other Lynch syndrome genes, there may be um, mismatch repair deficiency. And so these lead to particular sensitivity or what I consider like the Achilles heels of the cancer of getting, uh, of being sensitive to PARP inhibitors, uh, platinum chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So I'll come back to this, um, but this is just sort of a schematic to say there are a number of different pathways or families of genes that are important for DNA repair. And when you, when your cancer, uh, lat, when you, when you have a predisposition, you may have a tendency towards cancer that has this particular feature, which makes it sensitive to these drugs that we're excited about. Um, adding to the toolbox. So here's the special toolbox for BRCA2, BRCA1, MSH2, MSH6, and others. And this is, this is again, this, uh, at this point, um, uh, approved in this latest stage. I'm going to go over this slide pretty quickly, but this shows, this is a couple of papers um, showing, um, including one from our institution in 2016, that platinum chemotherapy is very effective in prostate cancers that have BRCA2 mutations. So the important thing about that is that platinum chemotherapy, such as carboplatin, um, while they're used standardly for other cancers, such as um, breast, ovarian, and pancreas cancer, they're really not typically used in prostate cancer unless we have a good reason to do so. And so knowing about a BRCA1, BRCA2, or kind of related gene is important because then we would think to add that to the toolbox where we might not otherwise think about it. Um, next, I'm going to talk briefly about pembrolizumab, which is also called Keytruda. This is an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, and the basic rationale to this is that if you have um, mismatch repair deficiency, such as associated with a Lynch syndrome mutation, um, the cancer may have a tendency to have something we call microsatellite high or having more background mutations than would otherwise be expected even among cancers. And when this happens, the, there are more what we call new antigens and the cancer is then more visible to the immune system because it less resembles the normal sort of healthy cell. So there's a molecule called PDL1, which binds to PD1, and together they will sort of put the brakes on the immune system and prevent your new normal immune system T cells from killing the cancer cells. And if we introduce agents such as pembrolizumab, which block PD1 or PDL1, there's other agents available that can stop those basically take the brakes off and allow the immune system to do what it normally would wanna do and um, address and kill cancer cells when they see them. Um, so we know that in advanced Lynch syndrome associated prostate cancers, pembrolizumab is an option in 2017. Uh, the FDA approved pembrolizumab for cancers, including prostate, but not limited to prostate. So actually it was an interesting FDA approval because it's for any patients who have these features, whose cancers have these features, um, who have mac microsatellite instability, this, this particular thing that doctors can test for, or mismatch repair deficiency, um, and who have exhausted all their available kind of standard treatment options and don't have any good alternative, then they can be eligible for pembrolizumab. We know that the prevalence of these features in prostate cancer, if you look at all prostate cancers in a series of a thousand, is still relatively rare, but of these, um, about one in five actually had Lynch syndrome. So if you know you have Lynch syndrome and then you develop prostate cancer, this might be something really important to know about because it's, a, it's another kind of um, tool in your toolbox that might not be options for people who don't have these features and mutations. I'm gonna skip over this slide. This is kind of a schematic of PARP inhibitor mechanism of action. I think for this audience, probably you're familiar with this concept of PARP inhibition and, and why it's effective for BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. Um, and then I'm gonna talk next about um, the phase two Triton uh, study, which uh, led to the FDA approval of Rucaparib, which one is, is one of our PARP inhibitors for prostate cancer. In May of 2020, on the 15th of May, um, the FDA approved Rucaparib for um, advanced prostate cancer after two of our available really good drugs called uh, abiraterone or enzalutamide. Basically, they're, they're in the treatment toolbox. Um, they work really well. So the approval is after one of those two agents and or and docetaxel, which is a chemotherapy. Um, and patients who have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations in association with their cancer. So these two um, waterfall plots are really showing the, um, the scans showed that the cancer shrank 
Um, and the PSA, which is a blood marker of prostate specific antigen, it's a tumor marker that we have in prostate cancer. We can measure the activity of the cancer that dropped. Um, and in the bottom is BRC1, or you can't see it that well, but basically the red dots are, are patients who have inherited or germline BRC1 or 2. So you can see, you know, a good proportion of them had these mutations and they did. Those are the patients who appeared to respond really well to rucaparib. So that um, is an option. And then I'm going to talk next about the phase three study, uh, Profound, which led to the approval of a second PARP inhibitor called Olaparib, which is now an option for patients with prostate cancer. This is a busy slide. The point is really that they studied two kind of groups. One group was BRC1, BRC2, and ATM. That's what I would maybe sort of think of as the varsity group. And then there was a junior varsity group, which is um, cohort B, which had genes we don't know as much about. BRC, BARD1, they're less common, but they're important if you have one of these mutations. BRIP1, CDK12, CHAC1, CHAC2. You can read through the list, PALB2, RAD51. So these are sort of the second list where we don't have quite as much information, but we think they might, these patients may also benefit from um, PARP inhibitor. So um, this next slide, also really busy, but I'm going to focus your attention. This is from the, the paper, um, which is, you can find it um, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, but this is a sort of, um, I'm blowing up this area down here. And the point really is that in they were able and um, to report that uh, by gene. So instead of lumping the whole team together, let's say they're gonna parse out genes one by one. So you can see BRCA2 and I'm giving BRCA2 an A plus because um, this plot basically shows, this dotted line shows that anything to this side, left side means that Olaparib is better and anything to the right side means that the control group uh, was better. And so BRCA2, gets a really high score because it's very clearly better. Um, BRCA1, the dot is on the left side, but there's a wide confidence, meaning that we don't have as much data or information and we're not, you know, we're pretty confident it helps, but it may be like a B plus and not an A plus. Um, and then PP2R2A actually got an F, it fails because it's very clearly on the other side of this dotted line. So that's actually not included in the FDA approval. Um, so if a laparib were a class in middle school, we're sort of in September back to school, um, it would get a, um, yeah, so BRCA2 would get an A plus and the other genes passed, but we need a little more experience and information to know, um, is this gene a genius? Be, um, but we simply didn't have maybe stable internet connection by Zoom, so we don't have enough information yet to know. If, as we get more information, maybe we'll be able to say exactly, tighten these lines and see with more confidence how well it predicts. Or maybe that gene is an average student came every day and we get a lot of information, but their average ability. So these are kinds of things that we still need to learn as we get more information about these individual genes. Um, this is kind of another way of showing the data. Um, and basically to, I won't go into, them in great detail, except for if we remember the cohort, the varsity A team, BRC1, BRC2, and ATM, that's on the left side. Um, very clearly, the two curves are separate, which means that the blue line is better, and that's the a line that got a lab rib. There are two different ways of measuring it, one by scans and one by how long the patients lived. And then on the right side here is if you put the A, the varsity team together with the JV team, the junior varsity team, and you lump them together, there's also a separation, but you can see that the separation is not as wide. So that argues that maybe your star player like BRCA2 is carrying the team. And if you change, um, you know, look at players individually, you might learn more about their individual characteristics. But, but these are still good options for any patients who have these genes um, and they still go into the toolbox. I don't wanna sort of diminish the enthusiasm. I just wanna sort of point out we're still learning about the individual gene mutations and how well they predict and maybe we need even more strategies. So this is this next slide. How do prostate cancers with other gene mutations besides BRCA2 respond to rucaparib? This was actually a really nice paper um, from the Triton study, two study where they actually allowed 
um, it wasn't the primary group, but they did look at some of these less common genes, for example, ATM, CDK12, and CHECK2, they actually found in this, in this smaller study that the brucaparib looks a little less effective for patients with those cancers and pro those prostate cancers and those mutations. But there was an, you know, a, a signal that perhaps men with prostate cancer with PALB2, BRIP1, FANC A, and RAD51B might actually benefit more than, 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 um, more uh, than the group, the, this first group. So we just need more experience and other ways to measure the individual performance of these individual genes. And so thinking about, you know, a sports analogy, we need to just see more games. Um, we need to think about maybe training camp sort of observation, you know, at the, you know, Olympics just happened like trial times. What are, can we have more data about these individual players, individual genes? And are there statistics we can come up with like batting averages for baseball or first serve percentages for tennis or first downs in football? We need this kind of information for each gene over time. Um, and so these are some ways that we can begin to do that in the laboratory using things like genomic footprints. I'm not going to go into those details, except for these are different ways of measuring performance characteristics, sort of like these kind of sports statistics. We, we will need them for each of these genes. Okay, so understanding individual players like individual genes will improve our overall gameplay, our strategies overall. When we think about this toolbox um, of precision oncology in the advanced disease setting, the more we understand the individual players, the better we're going to be able to use them earlier in this localized disease setting and maybe even at the at-risk setting so we can tailor our treatment even better than we currently can. So just as I said, find cancer earlier, use these targeted agents and therapies earlier. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears now and talk briefly. I talked a little, uh, I spent the last few minutes talking about the specialized treatment toolbox. I wanna also now remind you that there's still this other toolbox that's available. It's a really big toolbox. It's a really good toolbox. At this point, we don't know that any of our mutations would not respond to these conventional um, kind of toolbox drugs. So my point is, um, we, we would try all of these, plus you might get extras until we learn more. I'm gonna um, not have time to go through all of these, uh, one through nine, but I do wanna tell you a little bit about 10 because it's exciting and new in prostate cancer. So um, there was a phase three vision study that was reported in June of 2021 at our American Society for Clinical Oncology meeting. Um, and this is the name of the drug, as I mentioned earlier, LU177PSMA617. It's also called lutetium. And the idea behind this is that it is a radiation molecule, a beta particle emitter. So it's a type of radiation and it's tagged to an antibody that recognizes prostate specific membrane antigen. So it recognizes the protein, a little tag that's on the surface of prostate cancer cell. And so it's essentially like a homing device that will deliver this radiation to cell prostate cancer cells that express this tag, this little blue um, cartoon in the blue, in the cartoon is a little blue tag and deliver this radiation and cause double stranded DNA and DNA damage which of course, if you have, let's say a DNA damage repair mutation, like, um, you know, uh, in homologous recombination, like BRC1, BRC2 in the family of homologous recombination DNA repair genes, or even mismatch repair, this may actually be pretty effective, right? Because it's sort of adding more errors to a system that's already vulnerable to uh, DNA damage. Um, so, the study actually wasn't so wasn't um, limited to people who had particular mutations. It was for all prostate cancer patients with advanced uh, prostate cancer um, after they'd had docetaxel, so very late stage prostate cancer. But you can see there's a separation of the curves, and so this this um, was a positive trial, and we do anticipate it to become available soon. Uh, we'll have to see the details of the approval, but we're all excited about this and wanted to let you know about it. Um, the next slide um, is just to say, you know, this is a drug that doesn't require you to have a mutation such as BRCA1 or BRCA2 to receive it, but we're particularly interested in knowing does it work better or worse because of how it works. So I mentioned earlier it causes cancer cell death through making double-stranded DNA breaks. 
and double-stranded DNA breaks our uh, repair is deficient in cells or cancer cells with BRCA2 mutations. So um, there's some early, early data now saying, you know, on the one hand, maybe it, um, BRCA2 mutations cause poor response, but on the other hand, it may be that there's exceptional response. And I personally think it may be, you know, we have to sort of see the data, but I'm hopeful that actually because of the way it works, we may see uh, I'm more leaning towards this, which is an exceptional response. So either way, it's a really exciting new type of treatment and we'll learn more as we begin to use it and study it more. Um, so that brings me to the next slide, which is gathering better statistics by players. And can we do it not just by game, but maybe if you think about that analogy, can we do it over the player's whole career? So this is the PROMISE study or registry study. Um, and basically it's looking for people who have prostate cancer and have inherited cancer mutations and then following their treatment course over time. So we learn about what works better, what doesn't look, work well. It does have a component that allows for um, testing of gen genetic testing for men with prostate cancer if they don't already know what they're, whether they carry a mutation or not. Um, people in this audience might, might know that they have a mutation or have a family members who have prostate cancer and may have a mutation um, that's inherited. And then we'd, we'd invite them to follow over time to let us know what treatments they got. Did they work well? Did they not work well? You know, what happened? So can we learn not just limited to one particular treatment, but over the whole career or the whole disease trajectory, can, how, how can we learn the most and give that back? Um, and so this is on the FORCE website. It's prostate re uh, Promise Registry, Prostate Cancer Registry of Outcomes and Germline Mutations in order to uh, improve survival and treatment effectiveness. It's fairly easy. You can do it from your own home. You get a DNA kit. Even if you know you have a mutation, you can do the test again because we are going to be looking at other genetic modifiers to even the known cancerous gene. Um, you can get the results and then you can join us and hopefully together we can get more statistics and help us learn more about these drugs. Um, and so the goal, as I said, is to collect and assemble knowledge um, of the relevance of these mutations and the importance of them at every single stage of the disease trajectory. So from at risk to localized, how do we cure people better? How do we think about the curative intent treatment strategies? How do we use advanced treatments? And then how can we use that information to be more valuable at this point so that this gets turned around and more people are diagnosed and cured and don't even need this because they don't have to get there. Um, so that's this um, prostatecancerpromise.org. Um, you can check it out. Okay, so take home points. I hope I've um, let you know and shared some of the excitement about new exciting treatments for prostate cancer. There's a few exciting ones in the special toolbox, PARP inhibitors, platinum chemotherapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and more in the kind of clinical trial pipeline. For men who have inherited cancer risk mutations in, these are just some examples, BRCA2, BRCA1, MSH2, and others. The standard toolbox, the ones that don't require you to have a mutation, that's growing. And that's also maybe extremely effective. I um, don't want you to forget about those. Um, and, and they can be just as effective and possibly even more effective. Um, for prostate cancers. And I gave you an example of lutetium-177, um, which we're excited about. We generally need to collect more knowledge about individual genes and using the analogy of teams, players, statistics, and a career worth of data. Um, I think we'd, we'd really like to begin to build that to be able to refine our knowledge. We know already that BRCA2 is not the same. I don't need to tell this audience. It's not the same as BRCA1, it's not the same as PALB2, it's not the same as MSH2 and those others, ATM, CHECK2. We need to learn about each one individually so we can really kind of provide the most tailored management and, and new strategies. The pro well, prostatecancerpromise.org is a registry opportunity that you can partner together with us and learn about the long-term treatment outcomes. Part of the study is actually to give that information back to you. So we, we actually would provide updated information every um, newsletters and clinical trial opportunities every six months to 12 months. And we give that back to the participants. And so it's a partnership. Um, and then consider clinical trials, either registry trials, like I just mentioned, or therapeutic trials, because we can strive to do even better. I told you about a lot of the new exciting agents, but there's even more. Um, we keep trying to do better and, and we want to do it for you, with you. Um, and I think there's a lot of excitement. Um, we want to keep building those toolboxes. 
So here's the shared vision. I've shown this slide, this schematic before. Um, this is my patient population, patients with advanced prostate cancer, the bulk of my population. We know that there's this, um, you know, this proportion of men, one in 10, who have inherited cancerous mutations. We wanna think about their siblings and their children and hope and guarantee and work towards having all of these people have options for tailored cancer screening, risk reduction, and curative treatment strategies. Um, and then today, I hope what I've shown you and kind of given you a flavor for is that we also want to do that for prostate cancer at every step of the disease spectrum. And hopefully we'll really be able to change the natural history for people who might be at increased risk of prostate cancer at this stage. So if we're thinking about this green box being where we currently have FDA approved targeted therapies for, you know, BRC1, BRC2 and Lynch syndrome families, I hope that we can change that so the whole field is green and we have tailored options for everyone at every stage for prostate cancer. So that's all I have to share with you. I hope um, you know you uh, just leave you with the fact that I think if we do efficient learning and integration of genetics and prostate cancer clinical care, that can be a force multiplier against cancer. Um, thank you so much for your attention and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.